And they, everybody knows they all go back to their families when they're 18 and three months. They go to wherever they're told to go, they last their three months, and they go home. This is what happens, and nobody deals with it, right? So to me, you've got to really give them the impression that they can get these things that matter to them and make sure they cope well with the family when they get there. Um, so the idea in validation is you're strictly sticking with what's true, accurate, and understandable. Um, it's, or something that's well grounded in facts. Um, you want to give the client accurate feedback. Okay, so so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of times when people say, "I'm sure you were doing the best you can. Um, I, uh, it'll work out." Uh, this sort of thing, which is positive, but it's not validation because it's not specific to the facts on the ground. Mm -hmm. And you know, this kid who just you know flipped a table may or may not have been doing the best they could in that particular moment. They may have decided to flip a table, and it's extremely invalidating to tell them that they wanted to do something else, right? Uh, so what what isn't validation? Soothing is not validation. Chit chat is not validation. Frequently praise is not validation because a lot of uh, folks don't feel the praise is deserved. So then you've invalidated them. Or they associate praise with withdrawal of help. Because in the chaotic, stressful families they're in, when they're doing well, the parent or the caregivers are facing in another direction to deal with some other problem at hand. So doing so praise is often a signal that help will now be help and attention are being withdrawn. So they may find it extremely invalidating, and that's often why people praise somebody for a really fabulous session and the next week the, the patient's gone all the hell in a handbasket. Um, and what happens? Um, and global non-specific positive feedback is not validation, right? You, and then in DBT again, we have a whole set of different levels of validation where you can sort of do this. You kind of memorize the different levels, and that way, you even when you're completely dysregulated, have something to kind of cue yourself to keep putting out there and um, make sure that you've got uh, you've got it. And radical genuineness is this idea that you're. Um, you're just your total self, and you're no different with your patients than you are with your colleagues and neighbors and brothers and friends, and you don't have a sort of therapeutic uh, kind of dynamic between you, sort of a barrier between you, but you're just very transparent and you are who you are. So I sound just like this when I was a skills group, for instance, with my clients, as I do right now. Uh, another key element in DBT is orientation and commitment. I think again, just like validation, this is implied in a lot of other behavioral interventions, but there's not actually much technology to help you achieve it if you don't have it. So um, in, because DBT is working with complex and extreme people, and it is a voluntary treatment only, you cannot do DBT involuntarily. Okay, I just need to repeat that. Cannot do it involuntarily. It's not DBT if it's involuntary. General, it often doesn't work, and sometimes it actually makes people worse, and it goes really badly. And then the patient believes the DBT doesn't work, and then they'll never go to DBT again, which makes me absolutely berserk. So, you know, really just remember this: if they're not agreeing to do it, they are in what we call a pretreatment stage, and all you're trying to do in pretreatment is orient them to the treatment increase their commitment to their own long-term goals and to using DBT targets as a way to get there and to agreeing to the treatment and its limits like one limit I usually point out to my patients is that DBT is a talk therapy if you don't come and we don't talk there is no therapy <laughs> so it is a limitation I cannot give you the talk in a pill that you can take home and not bother to come to Harborview which I know you hate coming to um, you're going to have to actually arrive in the room and spend the time with if, you, if you, you are going to have to do homework. If you don't do it, you just don't get that much bang for the buck. That is sort of a limitation of this kind of therapy. It's not an antibiotic. Um, you know, I usually tell it's a lot more like radiation and chemotherapy. So really pretty, you know, there's a reason my patients call it diabolical behavior therapy. Uh, it's often not that much fun. And, but if you, but there's a lot to saying this that really actually engages kids. People oversell the treatment in a way that just turns the kids off or turns the adults off. Um, to the treatment. Um, and there are a lot of commitment strategies in DBT that are designed to move the kid from pre-treatment to treatment. So there's specific strategies we use to get the patient to move 
This also applies to therapists as well as clients. It's a voluntary treatment for therapists as well as clients. It works very badly when therapists are forced to do it. I can give you chapter and verse of every disaster I've ever worked on where therapists were forced to do DBT and it just, you know the underdog slogan? You can make me do it, but you can't uh, make me like it, and you can't make me do it right. <laughs> it applies to clients, and it applies to therapists. So, in DBT, we use the other thing that's really key is a consultation team. It's not just like any team meeting. It's got a very specific focus that we call therapy for the therapist. Um, that means that the, anyone uh, clinically working with the, the client or family is in the team, and the goal is to change the therapist's behavior in general, not to deal with this one case in front of us and get the therapist different with this one case in front of us. Um, and the focus is on increasing the therapist's motivation and skills to do DBT and stay with the team. So we have a lot of agreements, structures, principles um, to make that happen. And the most important thing is only have on team those who are actively providing DBT and individual group or coaching don't have visitors, don't have bosses, don't have other people in there, or forget them. Sort of if this basic principle is if you wouldn't include them in group therapy, don't include them in your team. Because otherwise, therapists just don't really get down to the reality of what's going on. So we have spent lots of time in implementation trying to get managers who want to be on teams to take patients. We're getting or working really, really hard to get them out of the team. And the other thing, I'm really running short on time here, DBT is only done as long as it's working. So we always do it for a fixed duration with a re-up if there's substantial improvement on outcomes. In DBT, we don't consider it ethical to continue with a treatment that's not working. Uh, so it's really important because some people kind of get in DBT in these case management programs that seem to be in there for like eight years, going absolutely nowhere. That is not adherent to DBT. You would never do that in a DBT program. Uh, uh, we look at this at the client family level, but also at the team agency level and system level. If it's not working, they shouldn't be bothering to continue it. Um, and we want, want people to analyze at the individual level with diary cards and session notes. It's a great way to use the diary cards are something that patients are completing in general. It collects a lot of data. It's very easy to check whether the patient's getting better. Uh, but you know, I've spent a lot of time with systems trying to get them to use their incident reports and there are other systems that are already in place to track all this stuff to see are they actually having improvement. So in a couple of minutes, how do we train in DBT? There's a lot of individual strategies. There's lots of things that different people do to learn DBT. So we do academic training, so Sarah and I have a course we do every year here. Marsha Linehan has a course. She's actually got a um, R32 grant from uh, NIMH to evaluate her training process. Um, and collaborate in trying out her training process. Uh, there's two days CE type trainings that Behavioral Tech, which is the arm, uh, kind of the group that Marsha started to do trainings. They have lots of um, two day trainings. I'm not a big fan of them myself um, because I've spent too much time immersed in health services where we know that CE doesn't work. <laughs> I just don't have a lot of faith in it, but nonetheless, it's a good introduction. Uh, there's um, They've also been doing a lot of use, use of technology at Behavioral Tech, so uh, there's some interesting videos and CDs that train skills and mindfulness, and there's online learning uh, for people. The chain analysis and validation online learning course has just popped up in the last week or so, for available uh, for the public, so uh, those are well, I think if you want to look at it, I mean, when I, given the context that we're in, like whether we should recommend it to people or whatever, I'll put you in touch with the, their, the person who coordinates it over there. Do it the back, do it the back door. You can't do it; it's just looking at the website. It is every single.